Is there a Mr. Carter in the room? I'll have a 4K UHD restoration in Dolby Vision HDR with a limited edition hard box poster and book. I want you to turn your Dolby Vision on, take your booklet out, unfold your poster, hang it on the wall. I want you to watch your special features, all of them, right now. Hello and welcome back to this Down for Idealistic Crusade. Of course, I'm reviewing the BFI's 4K restoration and physical media release on both Blu-ray and 4K UHD of the iconic 1971 masterpiece uh, directed by Mike Hodges and starring Michael Caine, Get Carter, one of the seminal British crime films, one of the really most iconic British films, period, that uh, unfortunately still here in the U.S. is not as well known as it should be. It's it's definitely a cult film, and it, it never, it wasn't successful at all here in the U.S. It wasn't even really uh, properly distributed by MGM, who financed the film. Uh, it did decent enough business in the U.K. on its original release, but it's one of those films that uh, it, its cult reputation grew over time. Uh, anyone who ever sees it can't really forget it, but it took quite a long time for it to become the sort of iconic film of the of, of British cinema that it's now regarded as and it was really I think what the, what cemented it was the uh, the late 90s sort of relaunch of the film you finally had a, a release of the film soundtrack on CD and then uh, that that also tied in to the film's uh, sort of, well essentially it's 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 restoration at that time or, or at least a, a new version was was made to actually get in circulation and then we finally got the film on a major uh, video release from Warner Brothers so once once it hit DVD in about 2000 that's that's what I think a lot of people really uh, finally got to see it on on a much larger scale and then it's it's a legend only grew but unfortunately here in the US it's still one of those films that only uh, fans of British films or Michael Caine fans or uh, cult cinema fans or uh, people people who are essentially cinephiles are going to know Get Carter. But uh, unfortunately, you say Get Carter, most people think of the ungodly <laughs> Sylvester Stallone remake because uh, that, that, that is unfortunately much more circulated here in the U.S. Uh, but at least the film is better known n- now here than it was, but uh, it, it's also had a very sporadic video history history and not a whole lot of releases actually so that hasn't helped things uh i started doing some digging uh when this release was announced and i hadn't realized just how bad it had been but essentially you didn't have any video releases of get carter until uh the the first vhs releases which were in the early 1990s and uh, we didn't even get a video release here in the u.s until one vhs from mgm in 1996 so uh, it definitely did not have good distribution if any at all, which has helped to it being a definite cult film title. But it's one of those cult films that its fans do uh, speak so highly of that uh, you know it's basically been up to the fans to to spread the magic of this film. I know I've shown this film to so many people, uh, whether they're uh, even knowledgeable of, of British culture or not. This is definitely one of the most iconic British films that does have a, a bit of a... Uh, not not quite a barrier, but uh, for most U.S. audiences, if you haven't seen a lot of British films and you don't know a lot of British slang or things, you know you 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 might be a little bit puzzled here and there. But it's it's you know it's something you could very easily get over because the film is so wonderful. But it is so unabashedly British that you know it, it's it's not going to to pander to anyone to, to try and make itself understood, which is why the uh, what happened on the original U.S. release with the redubbing of the opening uh, is is so funny because (laughs) some people apparently panicked and that's why we had the Americanized version with the uh, with the opening. Uh, essentially, mostly the opening was was what was focused on. That was uh, redubbed into more understandable dialogue, and then the film was stuck that way for for decades because they apparently had lost the original uh, British audio from the opening. Until again, that uh, uh, restoration project in the late '90s, which resulted in the worldwide uh, Warner video release. Uh, so. This film has not had a, a, you know, it hasn't had a special edition before this point. It hasn't had a big deluxe release like this with uh, legitimate extras and big fanfare put around it. So 
for those of us who have praised this film to the heavens and, and loved it ever since for, for years and years and years, this is sort of a vindication of, of Get Carter, which is long overdue. Uh, again, in Britain, it is the, the iconic film. It, it always has been. Uh, but here in the States, it's still much more of a cult title. Uh, what, what, what's magical about Carter, though, this is astonishingly Mike Hodges' feature debut. He had worked in television. He had worked in uh, you know some news and documentaries, uh, but he had been making uh, television films uh, up to this point. And MGM was, of course, in dire financial straits, and they were financing a lot of films that are would not be considered the typical MGM product. This was the same year that MGM financed and bankrolled Shaft, which, of course, was a, a cultural landmark and a massive financial hit. Get Carter is pretty much the same thing for, for, for British cinema, but, of course, it was nowhere near as uh, immediately successful or, or well-viewed or even seen uh, as, as Shaft was, which had a much wider uh, marketing campaign and thus reached a much greater audience than Get than, uh, Carter ever did. And ironically, when you watch Shaft, uh, because that was filmed on location in New York, uh, one of the theater marquees they pass is literally playing Get Carter, which had already come out by that point. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it quickly disappeared from that theater because its uh, U.S. distribution was, to say it was lackluster is an understatement. Um, so this this being done by the BFI uh, f- from you know doing a 4K scan of the original negative with Dolby Vision grading and new extras and supervised by Mike Hodges was was something really special. All the more so because uh, you know shortly after this this was produced and released, Mike Hodges unfortunately passed away. So uh, it's it's uh, uh, really amazing that he was able to participate in this release, and uh, thus two of of his most famous films were uh, he was able to oversee their restoration and big special edition packages uh, for both Get Carter and Croupier, which Arrow did uh, late in 2022. Uh, so that that adds a bit of poignancy to this release because of course he does appear in the extras as well. Uh, but 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 Carter is one of those films that. It, once it grabs you, it never lets go. It, it's, it's of course, on the surface, a British gangster film. It, it's described as the British gangster film or the British crime film that is so definitive and iconic that uh, when you do see it, you recognize how this influenced practically everything that came after it in terms of uh, any sort of British crime films. You can feel its influence on The Long Good Friday, on Mona Lisa, everything after this point, all the way up to Guy Ritchie and Black Stock and Two Smoking Barrels and so many other films. But uh, what uh, very few, if any, have ever been able to replicate is is the what makes Get Carter so special. It's not just that they go up to Newcastle and it looks like a, the totally miserable place that it was and it plays places you in a very grimy and gritty reality without uh, using uh, any major studio sets or trying to gloss up or change or or uh, beautify uh, what was a very almost sort of documentary approach to depicting uh, this 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 sordid tale in new set in Newcastle. What what makes it special is that uh, the film is very dark. It's a very dark story. It's very gritty. It's it's got very violent moments in the right places, and and the the intensity of the violence is what makes it seem like such a violent film when there's really not a whole lot of violence overall. But what makes the film special is this sense, this undercurrent of there being a, a sense of dark, morbid humor throughout. This is something that I, I think you can find throughout Mike Hodges' work. Uh, that if you, This is where you get into auteur theory, you know, the, the sort of oh, signature style of a director and all that stuff. Uh, sometimes you, you just get a feeling of the person. And uh, if, if, if that is an auteur theory, I don't know what is. Uh, but Mike Hodges had a, a, a just this wonderful sense of, of morbid dark humor there there's a sense of there's an intelligence there and you see this in every film he ever made uh but most especially the ones that 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 really uh he was able to fully identify with and and make his own and i think if you didn't have that uh get carter would be much more straightforward and it's this this sort of wicked sense of humor this sort of knowing humor and this sort of you know this is how it is 
this, but you know, let's 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 have a little fun with it. That's what makes Get Carter so enjoyable. That's why people quote it to the say. That's why I quote it. Uh, that's that's why you want to return to it. And when you do, it's like you're 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 getting. Um, you, you know, Get Carter's not a happy film. It's not. It's not. It's not a film for kids. But you know, I, I saw it at a young age, and I never forgot it. And um, uh, it, it's it's the type of film you reach for when you need that shot of espresso. You need that darkness. You need something with bite to it, but something you can also enjoy. Uh, because again, it's a very dark story. There's, there's, there's no, there's no redemption. There's no hope. There's no anything. And, and and sometimes you need that, but it's, it's this sense, this undercurrent of humor that, uh, makes it more palatable, but also makes you want to come back. It's like it, it, you rewatch Get Carter and, and you're just grinning from ear to ear. And it's like you're, you can wrap yourself in a warm blanket, <laughs> a warm blanket of acidity and grunginess and darkness and, uh, you know, uh, human depravity. <laughs> and yet you're enjoying every minute of it, even though uh, on repeat viewings, you know where the story is going. I mean, the, 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 you do even on the first viewing. That's another thing about Get Carter. Some people might label it as sort of having an art film vibe to it because it does seem to draw on some of the same... Uh, it has some of the same feeling that uh, John Borman put into Point Blank in terms of if you know Point Blank, it, it sort of... It, it has different interpretations of a lot of critics reading in a certain way. It seems like the conclusion is preordained and that Lee Marvin's character, uh, you know, in his relentless pursuit of the 95 grand, uh, nothing else matters. And the, the, the whole world seems to uh, be uh, almost set on pause. It has this dreamlike quality to it. And the relentless pursuit of, of the end goal is also here in Get Carter. And there is a sort of dreamlike quality, particularly uh, to the opening and closing, which is very much intentional. So I, I, don't, I don't know if it was a conscious thing, but uh, it's also mentioned in some of, the, some of the new commentary that there is definitely, and Get Carter, you get a little bit of the feeling of point blank. But again, the, the magical difference is the film's sense of humor, which Point Blank really doesn't have. <laughs> so um, if, if you liked Point Blank, but you always wish it had you know, a, a bit more humanity to it and, and a bit more whimsy and, and some fun to it, that's, that's Get Carter in a nutshell. So to briefly describe the plot for those who have never seen the film, and uh, this is a beautiful way to do so if it's your first time, uh, Get Carter revolves around uh, Michael Caine's Jack Carter, uh, who is essentially an enforcer in the London underworld working for two of the top gangsters who are essentially sort of patterned around the infamous Cray brothers. But uh, back in Newcastle, Jack's brother apparently has died under mysterious circumstances, and he decides he's going to go up there for the funeral on the iconic train ride that uh, makes up the film's opening title with the iconic Roy Budd main theme, which is one of the great film themes of all time. Uh, it's a very simple setup, but essentially uh, what it boils down to is uh, Jack Carter isn't satisfied with just finding out that his brother is dead. He has to know why, because it's pretty obvious that he was killed for some reason or another. Uh, the... the uh, Police seem satisfied with the explanation that oh, it was just an accidental death. But Carter is uh, completely convinced that uh, you know something else has occurred. And uh, as soon as he gets to Newcastle, uh, well, even before he leaves, uh, the the word is already out that uh, he's not wanted and that it wouldn't be a good idea. And he's told and advised to not go, but he goes anyway. And what hits you right immediately is this this morbidity in this sense of darkness and humor because uh, once Carter gets there, you know, it becomes very apparent that he didn't even like his brother. <laughs> <laughs> that there was a lot of bad blood, and that uh, you know Carter Carter hated 
his his family and where he came from and the the last place and the last thing he ever wants to do is to go back to Newcastle and ever deal with any of this stuff because he's gotten away from it and uh, this is reflected even in his character how he has armored himself against the world he's a very he has a particular uh, sense of style. He's a bit of a snazzy dresser. He does all these things on the train uh, that is, shows him as this sort of very cool and, and detached and stylish individual. And you get the sense that he's done all this and, and why he has risen so far in the London underworld is that he's so, still trying to maybe psychologically distance himself from his upbringing and that has motivated him on. And you get this throughout the film when uh, his cool demeanor, you, you get flashes of the internal churning sense of rage and and frustration and all these pent-up emotions that start to poke through the facade that he's put up, which humanizes him and gives you a better uh, psychological understanding of who this guy is, because uh, you're only getting it in little bursts like that. It's a way of making you more interested in the character, because it's like you're peeling back the layers of the onion, and you get more over-repeat viewings. That's how nuanced uh, Kane's performance is it's it's very cold and detached on the surface but he knows the right moments to pick up on this sense of humor that Mike Hodges is injecting throughout the whole film this and that they find those little bits of whimsy and and let Carter play it naturally which only enhances the the sense of humor and comedy throughout uh, so the, the 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 plot is very simple it, it, Carter gets back involved in the Newcastle underworld because uh, he's simply there poking his bugle in as they put it in the opening uh, they don't like that and they don't take kindly to that and so he's told immediately to get out of town and in some ways you could almost look at this as sort of a modern day western in terms of just imagine Newcastle is uh, you know a, a, a city out in the west and you have the the lone gunman travel in and uh, he knows his brother's been killed and he's simply looking for the answers all well, it's 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 a similar sort of archetype in a fascinating way, uh, but what what makes Get Carter fascinating is not only do you have Hodges injecting this sense of humor, which makes the simple story much more lively, but the whole film has a very documentary approach. It is a time capsule for Newcastle at that time, and it looks just as miserable <laughs> as it must have been. Uh, but fascinatingly, you get to see all of the inhabitants who try to make the best of what they have, and that makes the criminal element all the more fascinating because you see all the different ways in which the various local bosses and uh, racketeers and how, how they have ingratiated themselves into the Newcastle community and how they sort of um, lord over it in their own ways and how they constantly are doing battle with one another uh, to achieve their own ends, whether that is simply making money or uh, trying to become a respected businessman. There, they, there's, there's an interesting sort of uh, social commentary throughout, which ties in to this sense of there being a sort of documentary approach. Uh, the film was shot by Wolfgang Sushitsky, who ha- just does incredible work. Uh, this film had a very low budget, and again, to make the comparison to Shaft, same year, also an MGM film, uh, also shot on uh, real practical locations in New York with a very low budget, with a documentary approach. Uh, it's amazing how much uh, Sushitsky is able Able to convey and uh, what what his setups look like when you look at the photography of this film there's none of the issues you see in shaft in terms of it seeming low budget uh here in get carter the, the whole visual style perfectly enmeshes the viewer in the world that jack carter is moving through and there's never a sense of oh this is this is low budget and so that's why it's too dark here or uh, it's a it's a little blown out here what Susichki did with uh, practical lighting and with a minimal amount of, of artificial lighting and in all of these real locations and then some of the setups that he and Hodges got, it's just an incredible piece of work that only serves to further enhance this tale. And in some ways, Carter is also 
moving along like a private detective because there is the mystery to be solved and to be unraveled of uh, who killed his brother and why. And there is this sort of fascination in how with the audience and how Carter moves through the underworld and how he's unraveling the thread of the mystery, but how he's moving through the different areas of the underbelly of Newcastle, how he is interacting with characters with a very, very cold and detached demeanor. So again, you get that sort of feeling of, of point blank, but it, the the interesting thing, again, is how Kane's performance picks up on those little bits of humor to, to really play with them and to show that Carter does have a sense of humor and that he is still a human being as cold and remorseless and as violent and as nasty of a piece of work as that human being may be. He can still, you know, crack a joke here and there. And there, so there, with the building of, of, of Carter's plan and to then exact his own revenge. The audience fascination continues with just the depths that Carter is willing to go to and that he has seemingly no remorse and that anyone in anything as collateral damage is no problem. So if you played all of this straight, if, if this had been done uh, more in more of an arty style like Point Blank, it would have been a very cold film. Uh, if this had been played straight as just a standard generic thriller, it would have been a very cold film with not a whole lot of plot, and uh, people would have probably criticized it, and it wouldn't have been as certainly wouldn't have been as lovable. It's, it's a strange word to, to apply to get Carter, but that's why we keep coming, keep coming back to it. Uh, basically, it, I, I come back again to this sense of if anybody else had made this film, it wouldn't have been the same. It's this sense of ironic detachment and dark humor and morbidity that only enhances and enriches the whole experience of the film. So it's not just that it's got this documentary style. It's not just that it puts you in the world of Newcastle and it really rubs your face and the griminess and the grittiness of, of the criminal underworld and just how workmanlike and lived in that it feels, how, how it, it, it seems... Uh, rather, rather interesting that none of the, the, the none of the criminals and, and bosses of Newcastle are, you know, over the top and larger than life. That they are very much normal people who do incredibly terrible and nasty things. It's this sense of bitter irony that 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 makes you. That's what makes you grin. That's what makes you come back to this film time and time again. It's what makes it such a magical experience, and it's something that I think Mike Hodges brought to a lot, uh, pretty much all all of his other uh, films, uh, and that's what I always have sort of picked up on, and, and why I, I uh, just, just so incredibly respect and admire uh, Hodges as a director uh, and as 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 a person, as an intelligent being uh, with with uh, with that 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 sense of. Uh, deep irony and and his understanding and viewing of the world there so there is in some fashion maybe a, a tinge or I've always sort of uh, linked that to what I, uh, something I've always loved in in Stanley Kubrick's work and that that sense that there's a sort of ironic detachment uh, that the Kubrick's humor is something that I, is, is probably the number one thing I think people don't pick up on or miss or overlook because he had a wicked sense of humor uh, it's, it's usually very subtle in the films that he made, but you do get it in A Clockwork Orange in the same year of 1971, uh, which is why I think 1971 uh, for you know many reasons, but you know particularly for so many iconic films, is one of the watershed years of, of cinema history. But if, if you look at all of the films of 71, uh, and, and particularly the, the masterpieces like these, there is a sense of ironic detachment and humor in, in the best of them. So uh, it's interesting that uh, Hodges, on, of course, a much lower budget without the artistic recognition, is sort of working in some similar areas and will continue to do so, uh, as, as Kubrick always, always did. And Kubrick was also a fan of Hodges and, and loved uh, his version of The Terminal Man, which is based on the Michael Crichton novel, which is probably the most 
studio film that Hodges ever got to make. It was his his one film that he shot in Hollywood at, at you know at an actual studio. And of course, the whimsical sense of humor that uh, Kane and Hodges have and get Carter is very much put front and center in the next film they would do together, which was the for made the next year, which is Pulp, uh, which is a completely different film, but it is also uh, sort of playing around with some private eye ideas and tropes because you have a mystery writer who gets drawn into a, a, a whirlwind of deceit and treachery in beautiful sunset Europe. And uh, it's just a wonderful, dark, morbid, I mean, it's really a dark, morbid comedy, first and foremost, and uh, it's, it sort of basically takes this wonderful element that I think is what makes Get Carter so iconic and turns it into the whole film. So uh, if, if you love Get Carter and you've never seen Pulp, uh, do keep in mind they are completely different films, but... It's a magical little gem. It, it's been overlooked and undervalued ever since it came out. It's a, to say Get Carter is a cult film. Well, Pulp is an extreme <laughs> cult film, uh, but it is a beautiful, wickedly funny, amazing little gem. And I'm so happy it now has the the Arrow video release. So if you haven't seen it, please do check that out. Uh, unfortunately, that was uh, that was pretty much it for uh, Hodges and Kane making films together. They had started a a sort of uh, company, but uh, unfortunately, they they never made other films. Um, I think it's a darn shame because uh, you know to say Kane's performance in Carter's iconic is you know an understatement. This is the film you show people uh, who have never seen one of the true. Uh, amazing, legendary Michael Caine performances who just simply think of him as the old British character actor who pops up in all kinds of things from children and men to everything that Christopher Nolan wants him to randomly do. Uh, everyone who thinks that Michael Caine is the Michael Caine stereotype, who you know, and just the, again, the old man British character actor with the very Cockney accent that everyone loves to do impressions of, uh, you you show them Carter. You you show that's this is what you go for. Michael King has so many iconic performances. It's it's impo- He is one of the great legendary actors who is impossible to nail down. He is you know he has the classic star style in terms of his acting is usually very invisible and that leads most people to just say, oh, well, he's playing a version of himself, which is completely inaccurate. Uh, All of the great stars of classic Hollywood had this. Michael Caine has this in spades. That's why I still think he is the world's greatest living actor. He has an an incalculable range. Uh, You know, it's one of the the legends who's never given a bad performance. I think it's incapable of Michael Caine to give a bad performance. But uh, when you when you look at his most iconic films, uh, most people will point to Alfie, of course. But for me, there are two uh, legendary, most iconic Caine performances, Uh, and uh, one is, of course, his his uh, legendary performance as Harry Palmer in the three uh, Harry Palmer films of the 60s and then the two unfortunate uh, made-for-television films of the 90s. Uh, but the other is Jack Carter. And and part of that is what I was alluding to before, the, the extraordinary nuance of this performance. It, it, was, it was Kane's desire to really show how gangsters are not heroes and they're not mythic characters. They are very dastardly nasty people they do horrible things but they are still also human beings so they can crack a joke they can uh, try and, and 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 relax every once in a while and of course uh jack carter's version of relaxing is it's um uh you know very uh very uh, interesting shall we say uh but that Carter has absolutely no uh, sense of, uh, well, no, I, I can't quite say that. He does have a sense of morality, but it's, it's his own morality. And some of that does go back to the classic idea of the private eye with a moral code at his center. So the whole reason why we have this film and the story is because someone crossed the line and they killed Carter's brother, whether Carter even liked his brother or not. And whether Carter even perhaps had an affair with his brother's wife. You know, <laughs> they, 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 they didn't like each other. Carter hated his family, it seems. He hated everything that he came from. But 
Someone killed his brother, and he has to do something about it. He, that that goes all the way back to the Maltese Falcon and, and Sam Spade, that you know, when a man's partner is killed, he has to do something about it. That's just the way it is, uh, because Sam Spade didn't even like Miles Archer, and so there's really no reason for him to try and figure out who killed his partner, but he has to do it anyway. That's the famous speech in the Maltese Falcon. It is part and parcel of the, the central moral code of the private detective that you know, Dashiell Hammond established. Well, that's what you're getting in Carter. It's the same classic idea. It's, it's, it, it, you know, it, it, it is ingrained in, in, in Carter. This particular, there is a very particular set of rules. There are some things that just aren't done. And if they are done, then, then accounts must be settled. Uh, whether it's something you even want to do or not, it must be done. And there is a sense of Carter getting some sort of personal gratification out of doing this and trying to accomplish this and trying to succeed in the mission that is self-appointed that becomes increasingly obvious that it is an obsession and that uh, pretty much the the entire rest of Newcastle just wants him gone <laughs> but he's not going to leave until he solves who killed his brother and again accounts are settled so Going back to the idea of there is a sort of classical Western feel in this, which is very interesting because you know it's in Newcastle, uh, but there there is a, a just this palpable sense of grittiness of darkness inherent and that just makes this film feel so blisteringly vital and real and vivid, and there is. No single false note in Kane's performance. He is absolutely riveting. You can't take your eyes off him throughout the entirety of the film. And when you think that you see glimmers of humanity, that there's no way that Carter can be just as blisteringly cold and as much of a of a blunt instrument when he wants to be, he does, you know. It, it, it's it's this sort of push and pull that that makes the character so incredibly fascinating and makes uh, this one of the iconic lead performances of cinema. It is absolutely riveting. It is one of the you know, it's one of the great performances of that year of 1971 with so many iconic performances. You know, it, 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 this is one of those where Kane should have won the Oscar and that's saying something in the year of 71 with Malcolm McDowell and Gene Hackman and so many other legendary performances in that same year. Uh, they they all should have won the Oscar, but but this this is another level because of the sheer amounts of nuance in every single moment, move, look, glance. Uh, it, it is just an absolutely pitch-perfect, astonishing performance throughout. And uh, again, this is the film that you show people who have never seen a true Michael Caine performance. This is this is. The, what what makes people forever stop talking about the 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 fun we have with doing Michael Caine impressions and the sort of caricature uh, that people have in their heads of of Michael Caine, the character actor of of more recent years. This is this is the film that that stops all of that, and it it it, it sticks in the mind. It, it's a film that's not afraid to go to more daring and dark places. And I think that's entirely down to Mike Hodges really trying to get the spirit of uh, the original novel, which was written by Ted Lewis, which was called Jack's Return Home, uh, to really convey the spirit of the book, but to make it play by giving it this this sense of ironic detachment in places. You 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 get this sense of of Hodges behind the camera, you know, sort of not poking holes in the story, not making fun of it, but injecting a little bit of himself in there by by making sure there's this ironic detachment by making the audience participate this is a film that again this is a film that makes you smile uh, it, it which is so bizarre because it is such a dark film and such a brutally dark story that there there is no redemption for anyone there is no hope there is zero anything this is 
I, I think thus one of the most realistic films, actually, because it does get into the whole film is a gray area. It's not there is no black and white. There is no good and bad. There is just simply gray and gray moralities of of people simply trying to survive and take whatever they want whenever and wherever possible. Some seem to have at least some shred of a moral code left as uh, nasty and depraved as their actions can be, and that's our hero in Jack Carter, uh, one of the screen's great anti-heroes. Again, this is the, the, the type of film you return to when you just need that... You need something dark. You need something with bite, and you you need that that shot of espresso. You need something to return to to just get you invested in and to just enjoy wallowing in the dirt. That's get Carter. That's why it's so special. That's why it's such a cult film. That's why it's so unbelievably iconic, and why so many people rewatch it constantly. Why they quote it. That's why I quote it. That's why I return to it all the time. And every single time I do, I'm grinning from ear to ear, even in 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 the darkest moments, because uh, it, it everything is beautifully enhanced by this undercurrent of of ironic detachment and dark humor that's what makes the film play uh over and over and that's that's where the enjoyment factor comes in because without that again this this would be a very dark gritty remorseless film it would be like carter's remorseless crusade and and again it would probably play a lot more like point blank this is topped off by the incredibly uh atmospheric uh, score by Roy Budd, which is very, it's very sporadic. The the actual score, it's an entirety, is very short. There's not a lot of music in this film, but when there is, it's so striking. There, there's a sort of uh, jazzy feel in places, but then especially in the little cues uh, that, uh, especially the opening that establishes the Carter theme, it has this very eerie dreamlike sort of effect that is matched by the film's ending so there's these sort of bookends that again give you this sort of slight dreamlike dreamscape feeling that's the the conclusion is uh, predestined that there's no escaping the ending which again is is why i think the the connection to point blank is is so uh, so apt that uh, there, there is definitely some of that shared uh, dna at least in the approach but uh, th- most of the discussion of, Bo- of Bud's score is uh, deservedly about the main theme, which is played over Carter's uh, train trip to Newcastle. It's, as I said before, it's one of the greatest movie themes ever composed and recorded. It is a perfect musical rendition of what I've said uh, most in this review, that uh, the, the main theme is literally about the the whimsy and the humor that's inherent in this dark tale it's it's jazz but it's got not quite a tongue in the cheek but it's got this sense of just wallowing in the darkness and and sort of reveling in in the sense of humor and and enjoying the darkness if you will uh, it, it's it, there's there's nothing else in the world quite like it and its impact is such that it gives you every bit of Carter's character but in musical form and then that way the actual main melody the motif of that theme is then used as the Carter theme for the character throughout the score it's why we open with that and just the, the the, the barest minimal version and then most of the other cues which are sporadically placed through the film we get little echoes of that and this again leads you to the ending which makes it the whole film feel like it's a locked groove that the ending is is predestined and that is where uh, Carter is going to end up that's where he was always going to end up and this is set up in the very beginning and carried all the way through to the end so the music perfectly suits the film even though it's not a very long score and there's not a whole lot of music Uh, so that's why the theme is even more important because that is the most identifiable part of the score the most iconic part and that's what you know gives you the entire heart and spirit and soul of the film 
in three and a half minutes. It's absolute magic. Interestingly, uh, Hodges in his final film uh, really sort of returned to this same sort of spirit. Uh, in 1998, he had a sort of career comeback with the fantastic Croupier, uh, which starred Clive Owen. And then in 2003, uh, his final film was also with Clive Owen entitled I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. And some people have called it, I think rather unfairly, a remake of Get Carter. Uh, really what it is is a... a it's it's sort of a, a a spiritual sequel in some ways, but I I'd say more than that, I'll sleep when I'm dead is it's sort of riffing on a, a lot of the themes of Get Carter. There there is a, a mysterious death of a brother, and you have the the Clive Owen character sort of being drawn back into a world he thought he had left and put behind to discover who killed his brother or why his brother died. And that, of course, is right of Get Carter, but it, it does everything differently. This this is a, a film that is, it's also been termed sort of an art film, but it's also extraordinarily dark. But it, again, what's so fascinating about it and why I think it's, it's such a, an incredible sort of bookend to Hodge's career that it's sort of all these years later after all the other films that he made, here you have Hodges returning to similar sort of territory, and it's got echoes of Get Carter, but it's it's sort of an inverse mirrored version of Get Carter. That's why I find it so fascinating, and it is terribly underrated little scene and little disgust. So if you love Get Carter and you've never seen I'll Sleep When I'm Dead, it is a must-watch. It's a very different film, and I, again, I think rather unfairly, it's frequently labeled a sort of lesser remake of Get Carter. But again, I think the more apt way to describe it is it is the you know, the work of a mature artist, if you want to call it that. Uh, but it, it's it's like a an echo or a, a again, it's, it's a mirrored version of Get Carter. It's taking a similar sort of story concept into a different realm with a different presentation style and playing around with these story concepts. So that's, that's why I find it so fascinating and why I, I, I hate that it's so little discussed. But again, there's a lot of Hodges films that are little discussed. And then to also talk about another film that's little discussed, rather surprisingly, uh, even though Get Carter was not really successful at all, apparently someone decided that the, the story was a great idea and they actually produced a remake the next year in 1972. Uh, but it's actually a, you know, it's it's a black exploitation film. It's it's the 1972 film Hitman, uh, starring Bernie Casey in the Carter role. Uh, I've I've only seen it once a very long time ago. Uh, there is a Warner Archive DVD that I would like to pick up because I really do want to rewatch it. But essentially, you could watch Get Carter played out in a sort of. Oh, I mean, it is a black exploitation film if you love the genre. Uh, but it's got the Carter character and a much more overtly standout heroic type uh, character it's it's a different rendering and of course the, the, the you know it doesn't turn out the same way <laughs> it's it's much more of a standard telling of the same story but in the black exploitation genre so it's a completely different take on it and the tone is completely different so if you did for some reason want to see uh, Get Carter if it was more like a normal film and Carter was much more overtly heroic, you can do that. It was done in the 1972 film Hitman. So um, that's that's a fascinating uh, film to look at because Carter is so iconic, but to see it done in a completely different way without any of the, uh, the the sort of wonderfully morbid, ironic detachment that Hodges brought to it, 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 it doesn't play the same. It feels much more like the generic story that it, it could have been. Uh, it's still, it's a fun film from what I remember, but it's, it's 
very striking to see it done that way. Um, not because it's a black exploitation film, but because you have the 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 lead Carter character is is more of the straight ahead heroic type, even though he is also doing very bad things, uh, because the story is pretty much the same. But he's cast in the heroic light, and again, it doesn't have the same never-ending darkness and and grim reality to it that get carter does so it's it's a fascinating comparison that, that i highly encourage people to to uh, look at and watch uh along with get carter so i think looking at all three films uh you know get carter of course i'll sleep when i'm dead and the 1972 hitman uh it makes a fascinating study so uh if you have not looked at the other two films i strongly encourage you to do so they are uh, um, really interesting sort of variants and parallels to what you see and get Carter. So with that out of the way, let's turn to the BFI's Blu-ray and UHD 4K release of the new 4K restoration of Get Carter. Uh, this was done by the BFI with participation with Warner Brothers based on their elements because they, of course, have the MGM library and did the past releases. Uh, the film has had a number of, well, I guess one or two restoration attempts now. The first major one was in the late 90s, early 2000s that I mentioned before. This is what got us finally back to the original uncut British version without the opening uh, from the American dub with the redub voices that were very uh, obviously dubbed and and the dialogue changed around to, unfortunately, a rather humorous effect, which sort of marred the film for a good number of decades, actually. So that turned up on the Warner VHS and DVD release, and uh, that didn't really have anything other than uh, it did have a new commentary and an isolated score track. So it, it wasn't a full-blown special edition, but, you know, at least had a fantastic commentary and the isolated score. Uh, but that's how the film was stuck for a long time. The DVD was a snapper case. The, you know, it was it was an older Warner DVD with the, all that entails. So it was it was very much long in the tooth in, in video terms. It was very outdated, and you know it, the film really deserved the full special edition treatment. Uh, eventually, uh, Warner Brothers actually did surprisingly release a Blu-ray from a new scan. This was done uh, without fanfare. It was a UK exclusive at first. Uh, you had to special order it here in the US when you could finally get a copy. Uh, this was done from a new scan. It was it carried over the same extras, so it didn't have anything else. So it was pretty much a, a, a typical uh, Warner catalog title that, uh, you know, it, it wasn't bare bones because it did have a new transfer and it did have the uh, DVD extras ported over, but, you know, that was it. Uh, unfortunately, there were two problems. Not only was it UK exclusive at first, uh, but the two problems were one, for some reason, unfortunately, uh, they used the American soundtrack. So uh, you got the infamous dubbed opening uh, with the uh, terrible, uh, very silly dialogue changes and the very obvious dubbing. Uh, which Hodges even uh, makes fun of and bemoans how terrible it was in the commentary track. And he's like, oh, well, we put some here in the commentary track so you can hear how bad it is. And then you put the Blu-ray in and it's there on the main track. And you're like, oh, no. Uh, so there was a recall program. Uh, all the UK copies got fixed. But um, I, I know I'm such such a diehard fan of this film. I think I was the only person who wrote Warner Brothers here in the US. And I actually did get a corrected copy, which I have here. Uh, so I had to send in the one I had and get the corrected version, which did have the British audio restored. Uh, so I guess now that first pressing is sort of a, a collector's item because it has the American dub on it. And if you do have a copy here in the States or um, if you have any version of the Warner Blu-ray, you, it, it's probably unfortunately got the American dub on it. Uh, the other thing is um, I, I had actually gotten to see a print of the film, which is a very rare thing to do just before the Blu-ray came out. So I knew what a uh, what what the uh, what what the film looked like on the big screen from a print finally and how much it, uh, more amazing it looked than what we were used to on the old DVD. Uh, the issue with the Warner transfer on the Blu-ray is 
at that time, they were, and this still sort of continued in different areas, they, they did have a sort of house style in terms of the color timing. So it was a vast improvement over the DVD, and it looked very close to what the, uh, what, to what the print experience was. But there was an unfortunate uh, color push here and there to the unfortunate sort of teal that is rather prominent in a lot of Blu-ray releases. It's not just a thing on the internet of people saying, oh, orange and teal is everywhere. It does crop up. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, Fox was probably the worst with their catalog titles for a while of making everything uh, almost like it had a teal wash, things like The King and I. But uh, here in Get Carter, uh, you, you see what Warner was doing at the time uh, with a lot of their Blu-ray releases from newer scans. You see this in some of the Superman films, some of the Lethal Weapon films. There are some areas where there's there's a little bit of teal coloring or highlights here and there. It's thankfully rather minor here in Get Carter, but it did sort of mar the Blu-ray. It was the one uh, one real issue that it had outside of the, the soundtrack issue that got fixed. But, you know, we didn't expect anything else for Get Carter. We never expected it to get Blu-ray because uh, Warner apparently didn't realize how big of a cult film it was in the UK. So uh, they, they weren't going to put any money to, a, to making a special edition of it so we were it was amazing the film even got a blu-ray and a new scan uh and that's how it existed from 2014 on and i myself like a lot like a lot of others thought that was just going to be it unfortunately uh, so the announcement and release of the new bfi restoration in 4k no less was a massive shock and surprise so this is based on uh, the surviving elements. It is also utilizing the work that Warner spearheaded. Uh, so basically what turned up for the first go-round on DVD and then the second go-round on Blu-ray. Uh, the elements have not changed, so they're working from the same sources. And uh, the audio seems relatively the same across the board on all the releases because they did have to reconstruct the British audio from the American audio track because, unfortunately, some of the master elements were lost or, uh, well, actually lost. Uh, they're not known to exist as far as I'm aware. So essentially what I'm saying is uh, the BFI was working from the same things that Warner did for both of their previous video releases. Um, what you're getting here uh, in terms of the, so to talk about the picture quality, on both uh, the 1080p SDR and 4K UHD Dolby Vision grade, uh, this is the same source as what uh, Warner used for their Blu-ray. The biggest difference is not resolution from just going to 4K. Uh, it is everything is more impactful and better handled and better realized. This is, you know, it's been a good number of years now since I saw the the print of the film. This, I think, is, uh, you know, I don't know how you could do better visually. Uh, this is basically is is a perfect recreation of of the print I saw uh, from from what I remember. It doesn't have the color issue of the 2014 Blu-ray, and you don't have the uh, encoding issues of it being a standard Warner Brothers Blu-ray from 2014. Uh, the the new uh, scan is absolutely beautiful. The the colors, the black levels, the 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 getting into the dynamic range when you look at the UHD with the Dolby Vision grading. Everything is much more nuanced. The grain structure is handled beautifully. It just it it becomes like you're looking at a print of the film. Like you you you're able to much more fully invest yourself into the world of the film. It's like you fall into it. Uh, it is an absolute. It's it's revelatory throughout. And that's even in just the 1080p SDR disc. To say that it, uh, you know, wipes the floor with the old Warner disc is is an understatement. It's you know when you put them side by side, they do look pretty close on the surface because they're 1080p and it's the same source. But the difference in a modern 4K scan versus an older scan from 2014 with some color issues and uh, much heavier compression that that alone would makes the uh, makes the new BFI Blu-ray an instant purchase must own. Uh, not even getting into the special features and stuff. The picture quality increase is dramatic even in 1080p. But then you jump over to the UHD with the Dolby Vision in, uh, grading, and that just enhances everything. Uh, again, th this is one of those where. 
if you have the ability to view it in 4K with Dolby Vision, you will notice the enhancements over the 1080p disc, even though you know, there's probably not 4K worth of resolution in the original negative because we are talking about a 1971 film that was shot on practical locations with natural lighting. Uh, so it's not the the resolution uptick that you're uh, really going to be marveling over when comparing the SDR to the HDR. It's the finer rendering of everything again from the grain structure to the color depth to the black levels and this really shows off the beautiful photography of uh, Susinski perfectly uh, I, I didn't think it would look this good I really didn't uh, they they really they really knocked it out of the park in terms of the visual presentation. Uh, this is still, you know, a grungy film. This is a gritty film, and it has never been so beautifully realized on video before. Uh, the, the, again, the, pre the previous releases did not give it the royal treatment that this does. But on the other side of things, I was surprised to notice, um, you know, this is a 4K scan and restoration, but it does actually have a number of very tiny specks and bits of dirt and some little tiny lines throughout. So this is not a pristine restoration. These are things that were not on the the, the Warner release that were, I guess, cleaned up or removed, uh, probably by automated tools because it was not a, a big prestige release for Warner. Uh, so when you watch this, as beautiful as the transfer and presentation is, you are going to see a handful of, of specs and uh, things pop up here and there. There's even a, a very tiny uh, side gate here in the opening when you're looking at the projector and the and the opening sequence. Uh, it was it was rather striking to note. There's actually one point where there's maybe it's I don't know if it's a scratch or maybe almost a, a slight glue mark uh, that was not on the previous Warner edition. So that that was surprising to see. I, I don't know if that was maybe because the approach to this restoration was more hands off in terms of just letting the, the, the film appear as natural as possible, or they, I, I just didn't expect that going in. Uh, and of course, this is on both both presentations because the, it's the same bastard. So for all the uh, hyperbole of, uh, of, you know, the hype for the release saying this is the definitive uh, version of Get Carter and all this stuff and it's a beautiful restoration, it is. But I was surprised to see that, you know, some some bits of dirt and, and things throughout. They, they're all very minor, but they're, everything else is so pristine and so beautiful that when they do pop up, you do notice them. And especially in 4K on an OLED with the Dolby Vision grade and you're just, you know, being wowed by everything. And every once in a while you get a little a little speck of dirt or something and you're kind of like, wait, wait, what was that? <laughs> wait, wait a second. Let me go back. Did I see something there? So they're, they're, they're very minor. It's, it's nothing detracting from the presentation. But again, everything is so beautifully done that it's surprising to, to see some, some artifacts pop up. It's nothing unnatural, and it does very much give you the feeling of you're watching an actual print source. So, you know, it does have that sort of natural factor to it. But it was surprising to see a handful of those things pop up in this 4K restoration. So this is not... 100% blemish free. Let's put it that way. Um, so I, I, I was, I was surprised by that because I hadn't seen, uh, you know, any any reviews mentioned that. Uh, just you know, nothing. But the, the, again, the 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 how this was sold as the beautiful definitive restoration, and uh, I went in expecting it to be beautiful definitive restoration, and then yeah, I, you know, I see some dirt and some specks here and there, and I'm like, wait, what? Um, so, so yeah, that, that was, that was surprising. I, I, I'm not sure why that is, but, um, just to do keep that in mind, this is not a 100% blemish free, uh, uh, restoration. So it's kind of unfortunate that, that they couldn't just go in and, and, you know, do, do the little tiny bit of dirt removal on, on a couple of those that pop up throughout the feature and they are throughout the features, not just in one scene. But they, they're, they're very minor. They don't happen a whole lot. But when they do, you will notice them because the rest of the transfer is so beautiful in this new restoration. To talk about the audio, 
we have the original uh, or British audio, the original proper audio of the film in its original mono form in lossless PCM dual mono. Uh, this sounds pretty much like the same exact track that was on the Warner Blu-ray, which seemed very similar to what was on the Warner DVD. So I, I don't think they've been able to do anything or really did anything to the audio. It was more about the picture restoration, because uh, previously they had uh, recomposed and and restored the original British release audio track that was the intended audio. And again, it's really just the opening for the most part that that had the uh, differences with the American dubbing. So it, it's not really anything that you're going to notice as an improvement over what was on the Warner Blu-ray, which did have lossless mono as well. It is a bit thin and screechy at times. It is still a lower budget. 1971 film it's always been that way it's never going to be a sonic extravaganza you know it's it, it pretty much is what it is so if you've never seen the film before you will notice that you know the the high end is a little bit screechy in in places here and there when there's you know a you know a, a big music cue or a, a big sound effect or something but nothing out of the ordinary for again a low budget 1971 film so Audio-wise, it seems pretty much identical to what the Warner Blu-ray sounded like when you got the corrected one without the American dub track. So now we move on to the packaging and artwork of the limited edition box set. Now, this is the, a, a limited edition set. It is available in both Blu-ray and 4K UHD formats. Each is two discs, but unfortunately, this is not a dual format release, so you will have to purchase the Blu-ray, uh, and then uh, the 4K is sold separately but the actual box and packaging is the same for each. Uh, just the, the, the logos for UHD are added to the UHD edition. So this is a, a nice hard case box with the removable J card. This is the new artwork that was done for this restoration and then the film got a limited British theatrical reissue. The J card has the list of all the extras and the new transfer credits. The hard case is rather plain. Uh, we have the nice new spine, but then the back is just blank. So this is what you see on uh, that's what you see on a lot of Arrow releases with similar hard cases for a single film special edition. The back is usually blank. Inside we have a beautifully bound booklet. Well, again, it's not really a booklet because you know it's 75 pages long. This is just like an indicator book. Uh, so beautifully done, beautiful imagery, fully bound uh, with the BFI style rear, loaded with stills throughout, lovely new essays and pieces. So this is exactly the sort of high quality book that you expect from a release like this. There's also some vintage pieces as well. Uh, and again, it clocks in at, you know, 75 pages. So this is, you know, what what a film of Get Carter's uh, status deserves. And this is the type of book that you want in a release like this. So uh, again, this looks and feels just like one of the Fantastic Indicator books and is another reason why the limited edition is going to be a fantastic release to, that you should pick up because uh, you don't want to lose a really wonderful book like this and when they switch over to just the standard edition. We also get the fold-out poster of the new artwork in a sort of quad horizontal design, very frameable, uh, very nicely done, but in the wonderful touch, it is reversible with the original British quad sheet. And of course, this is totally iconic for Get Carter, even though the... Um, sort of flowery, very 60s sort of art design is nothing like the film at all. This is such a beautifully iconic image that, you know, even though it's not like the film whatsoever, it so gives you a sense of spirit that it manages to really give you an idea of the film. I've always loved this image, uh, so I'm so happy they, uh, they made it to the reverse side so you can actually have a nice frameable version of the original British quad sheet. Then we get to the actual case itself, and this is where you get the only major difference in the packaging. The Blu-ray has a clear multi-case, whereas the 4K UHD has the traditional black uh, UHD case. Everything matches the exterior. We get some nice postcards with uh, photos and stills from the film. And 
these are so wonderfully done. I don't know why anybody would ever actually use them for postcards, but if you wish to, they are actually, you know, printed as a postcard. And each one is from some of the most iconic moments of the film with the iconic quote actually printed on the back. So that's a nice touch. You didn't have the guts to do it yourself, did you? Then the discs themselves are very plain, so you get the striking image of Carter on the Blu-ray disc, then the same but in black on the Special Features Blu-ray. So each of these is a two-disc set. Uh, the Special Features Blu-ray is the same. Uh, it's just the main feature disc is a Blu-ray or a UHD, depending on which version you have. So of course, the UHD is the same, just in a UHD case same postcards and same discs of course now I, I do wish this had been a dual format release because then you know i could have just gotten one um originally a, a great friend of this channel sent me the uh blu-ray version to review because i hadn't gone 4k yet but then i did finally get uh, a 4k television and a, a player and started setting things up so I, I of course had to look at get carter in 4k so I wound up purchasing and special ordering the UHD release, so now I have both box sets, which are, of course, the same. The only difference is the feature disc. Um, I, a lot of companies are doing this where they do separate special editions. Um, I understand that, but it would have been nicer if there was just one that had both, so that way you, everybody could just buy one limited edition release and then not have to worry about uh, buying a second one later to upgrade when they finally do go 4K. And it's nice to have a Blu-ray version for, you know, if you're not at home or you, you want to, you know, take the film somewhere else and you don't have 4K equipment. And also, there, there are just times where you need a 1080p version of a film that uh, you're, you're not able to watch the 4K version. So I, I like having that ability. It's also easier to make screen caps when I do reviews because I, I don't have a way to do 4K screen caps as of yet. Um, so it, it would be nice if more labels did dual format releases like Criterion and some others. Um, but, you know, this is pretty much how Arrow and a lot of labels do it. So I, I, I get it, but it, it would have been nice to have have it be dual format. Uh, so that way I wouldn't have to have two different identical box sets of the same film. <laughs> now to talk about these special features, which are pretty extensive because this is, again, a two-disc special edition. And this is, you know, far beyond anything we had gotten before. Uh, so we have the brand new restoration credit. Uh, there is a brand new introduction that Michael Caine recorded for this release, which you can watch before watching the new uh, presentation of the film. It's just one of the usual little... It, it runs about three minutes, but uh, it is literally Michael Caine on his couch talking about the film and how it, that it's amazing that you know, <laughs> some 50 years later, we're, we're still talking about Get Carter. So that, that was nice of him to do and for, for uh, the BFI to be able to get something uh, new from the film star. Um, you know, it would have been amazing had it been an actual full sit down interview or something. But uh, still, it, it's fantastic to get uh, that that sort of seal of approval from Kane himself. Uh, then we do get the DVD audio commentary ported over, uh, which had Mike Hodges, Michael Kane, and Wolfgang Suchitsky. Uh, it is a phenomenal must listen commentary track it's still a great listen when you've heard it before uh if you've never listened to it it is a must listen it is i think one of the great audio commentaries uh, they go into every aspect of the film it is pretty much mostly mike hodges with uh, kane and susitsky popping up every once in a while for a few comments but uh it's an incredible listen. It is a fantastic commentary. If you love the film, that you've probably already heard, listened to it, but if you have it, you need to. It is a phenomenal, uh, you know, one of the all-time great commentary tracks. Uh, you get to learn every nook and cranny of the film from the people who made it. Uh, then we do get a new audio commentary with Kim Newman and Barry Forshaw. It's a really wonderful look at the film from a modern critical perspective and also in the perspective of other genre films and all the films and elements of British culture that this film has so completely influenced. Uh, they, they talk about 
you know, biographical notes. They talk about the production of the film. They talk about its release, its rather poor release history, how it became a cult film. And of the new extras, I think this one is overall the the best one. And I'm so happy that they commissioned a new commentary because I really think commentaries are the most... um, usually the most rewarding part of special features and you can get so much more information and you can talk at length about ideas and concepts and historical background and it's especially helpful when you have critics talking about the film today looking back at it and its overall legacy that that's really vital and that's why i'm so happy when there is a new audio commentary in addition to older ones even if they're great uh this is the type of stuff that you need to further understand the film's impact and this is a great track it's one of the best tracks of 2022 and of course you have kim newman on there so that automatically you know knows you you know you're going to get your money's worth uh so it 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 does not disappoint uh we do get the isolated score uh roy bud's score is carried over it's the isolated music and effects track that was on the previous warner releases but here it is spiffed up a bit by being actually lossless Uh, So that has made it over as well. So again, everything from the Warner releases is here. And the uh, best new extra in terms of visual extras, this is, of course, the most poignant one. Um, It's an hour-long 2022 BFI conversation with Mike Hodges himself about his career uh, overall and his background. And of course, they, they do get to talking about Get Carter. Uh, but it's so incredibly poignant because, you know, this was done, you know, just a few months before he passed away, uh, just like the uh, Get Carter restoration and release. So, uh, and he's literally there and he's still, you know, whip smart and just still uh, you just see such a, an incredible spirit in his eyes. And uh, it's just so incredibly moving and poignant uh, because. You know, not trying to be morbid, but you know, just knowing that, you know, that he would he would um, you know not be with us much longer at all, and that he was still you know able to do this, and that they did an, an extensive. A career spanning interview, not just talking about, oh, well, we're going to talk about Kit Carter and Flash Gordon because you know, that's going to be the things that people know the most of. And that's, you know, it was actually in front of an audience with a QA and a uh, and that it's at length. It's, you know, an hour long. It's incredibly poignant and moving. And he gets to talk about his career and enough in enough detail that uh, for those who don't know much of his other uh, film work or anything or even anything that he's done outside of Get Carter or Flash Gordon, uh, you get such a great overview of, of his other work that uh, I think it encourages people to then seek out some of the other films, especially little gems like Pulp. So uh, it's a wonderful thing, and it's so incredibly poignant because of when it was made just before uh, this this was actually released. Um, I think they've actually uploaded it to their YouTube channel. Uh, so you know you should definitely follow the the uh, BFI on YouTube. But they have uploaded some of these extras and some other pieces on Get Carter on their channel. So do definitely check those out. Um, then we continue on into a piece uh, for 24 minutes called Klinger on Klinger, which is uh, Tony Klinger talking about his father, Michael Klinger, who was the producer of Get Carter and who was really striving to try and make interesting British films uh, in spite of coming from what was viewed as, as a more... I guess you would say it was viewed as a little bit sordid, the background he was coming from, of, of sort of coming from the, 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 the world of adult films and trying to make legitimate, interesting uh, British films and, and trying to become a real uh, British power player in terms of, of film producers. So it's a wonderful uh, inside perspective look at, you know, from somebody who was there around the time of the production and inception of Get Carter uh, from that direct perspective of it actually being his son, talking about his father at length and his father's film career. And it, it's a nice, again, almost 25-minute lengthy interview. Uh, unfortunately, there is a, there are some... Uh, Things you'll notice when you watch this particular featurette, uh, there's always a lot of compression on a lot of extras nowadays, more and more. Uh, so you will see some some noise because they're in a 
in a theater a room at the BFI, and there he's sitting in all the red chairs. So you will notice some some uh, digital noise and things in the in the red of the chairs. Uh, but then there's also some sort of I don't know. It might be a frame rate thing, but it almost looks a little jump cutty when when you have him talking and he's sort of naturally moving, but it does sort of feel like it's you know a, a little. Um, uh, you know, like it, it cuts on the movement a little bit. Um, I don't know if that's just, you know, a, a flaw in the recording or something, but uh, it was something I noticed that I, I felt I should comment on. Uh, nothing, nothing bad, but it is, you you know, when you watch a lot of extras, you do start to notice when, when uh, th- things do have some, some noise or some various, you know, video things going on. Um, but that, that was the only one I really noticed in all of the extras. Then we move on to Don't Trust Boys, which is a nice, uh, 22 minute interview with Petra Markham who is the actress who played uh, Carter's niece in the film and she talks about her career at length and how she got to uh, be cast in the film by Mike Hodges and how you know it was early in her career but how uh, you know giving you that bird's eye perspective that first person perspective of uh, you know how the film set was and and how how the atmosphere was and then uh, talking about her career after Get Carter and she's a wonderful interviewee and it's it's nice when you get longer form interviews with with people that are not you know spoken to all the time who aren't the big names uh, they're frequently just as rewarding uh, as when you get a, a sit down interview with the bigger names so that was a nice touch because you know unfortunately there's there's not a lot of people who are still with us from 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 get carter so that that's a nice uh, again insider's perspective on the actual making of the film then we move on to the sound of roy bud which is 17 minutes uh johnny truck talks about uh roy bud the film's composer uh, his career and uh of course the get carter score this is a really wonderful piece because uh trunk actually was the one who uh really got the the iconic score relaunched because he finally uh, was able to license it for his own CD label and release the 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 film score in its first major soundtrack release so he talks about becoming a fan of Bud's work and of of his scores which were very niche and so he basically had to uh, compile what he could and have various 45s and then he talks about actually meeting Roy Budd and seeing him do uh, small concerts and things because unfortunately his uh, his his film career didn't last very long and he basically wound up doing uh, small concert tours and and small and uh, playing in small bars and things. So uh, he basically was able to to meet him when uh, you know Roy Budd was not very well known or regarded and unfortunately uh, died pretty young, just like um, um, the original author of the novel Ted Lewis did. Uh, so basically he gets to talk about how he has this personal connection to Bud's work and the Get Carter score and how he did try to at least sort of vindicate Bud's work by uh, by trying to get it out there so it would actually finally be uh, appreciated in the way that it should have always been. And that, you know, just how unfortunate it was that uh, uh, Roy Bud wasn't around to see that and, and to get that adoration. So um, it's it's a very nice piece because you get that that personal uh, that personal perspective again from from somebody who really knows this material because uh, this is the person who really got it rediscovered. Uh, then we move on to a, a fascinating uh, BBC uh, report on the actual set of the film. It's in black and white and it is a bit damaged and incomplete but it is transferred in HD so you get this fascinating sort of you know newsreel footage of a BBC reporter actually talking to the the cast and crew while they're setting up shots and things and you see Michael Caine walking around and so he talks to he talks to Michael Klinger the film's producer and you see Mike Hodges behind the camera and you see uh, Wolfgang Suschitsky and everybody as they're setting up various shots and things. So it's fascinating that the BFI unearthed this and was able to put it on the Blu-ray because these sort of things are fascinating for films, that, uh, that you, especially films that are iconic and that you know incredibly well to get that sort of behind-the-scenes perspective and actually have footage of on set is just a fantastic thing. So even though it's it's got some damage and the audio isn't complete, 
It's a fascinating time capsule, and I, it, it was wonderful to see here. Then we get the uh, piece with Roy Budd that was on the Warner releases, the old uh, promo video that was shot of him actually playing the main theme uh, with, with uh, the opening titles projected behind him. So that is carried over from the Warner releases as well. We also get uh, Michael Caine recorded a message to the premiere audiences. So we get this vintage bit of Michael Caine introducing the film back in 1971 uh, because he apparently wasn't able to go to the premiere. Uh, So that has been included as well. That's a lovely touch. Uh, Then we also get a really fascinating uh, documentary piece uh, entitled The Ship Hotel Tyne, Maine. Uh, this is literally about a, a pub on the banks of the River Tyne, and it was made in 1967, but it gives you that pure time capsule feel of what the pub atmosphere was and thus the life of the town. So it's basically giving you an idea, once again, like the film does, of Newcastle in its sort of gritty, grungy prime, I guess. Um, you, when you look at this, you know, it kind of seems like maybe some of it is is perhaps staged a little bit in terms of the, the various dramas that are going on. But it's a fascinating inclusion, and it is, again, 33 minutes, so it's pretty lengthy. Uh, But it's just another sort of perspective on what this place and time was like uh, for for the inhabitants. And it's all centralized in this one pub uh, where this documentary is set. Also included in the extras are original trailers. Uh, Well, I should say uh, the original trailer, which is a standard F upscale like it was on the DVD. And then the BFI has made a new sort of 2022 trailer for the restoration. So that is uh, presented in HD. So we do get at least a small trailer gallery. Also included is what's called a script gallery, but it's actually uh, Mike Hodges' actual script for Get Carter. It is pretty much what you see in the film with maybe one one or two slight dialogue changes and uh, one or two bits of business are aren't are, are a little bit different but as you as you scroll step through the gallery it is literally page for page as far as i could tell uh the the, the real shooting draft for for get carter and it's literally reproduced so that was a fantastic touch because I, you know i saw a gallery and i expected you know a couple pages but not the whole thing so that that's fantastic and then we close out with the a new 80-page book with new writing by Mark Kermode, Tim Peelan, John Oliver, and Jason Wood with Alex Cox's introduction to the film's movie drum screening back in 1990, which was a, a really major thing that introduced the film to a lot of new audiences uh, back when it was finally getting shown on television. And the book also includes very stills and notes on the restoration. So that closes out the supplements. Uh, it does take up the entire of disc two which is a blu-ray so these are all you know 1080p the only thing i will say is uh, while this is finally a true special edition that is uh, worthy of the film itself i you know these are all great extras but i, I was kind of left wanting a bit more there isn't uh, a, you know an actual documentary about the making of the film like you would uh, the, the sort of traditional piece you might expect um but all this stuff is covered in the commentaries so i do think the uh, i i think the commentaries give you the meat of of the actual production materials and then this is supplemented by the by the featurettes um i think the most rewarding of the new video extras is the mike hodges interview simply due to it being fully career spanning and just how incredibly poignant it is and that it is you know, over an hour long uh, but the whole package is really well done i just I, I kind of wanted a bit more, but then again, I am a Get Carter fanatic, so I did know a good amount of this material already. But you know, it, it, it's hard to fulfill that 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 sort of uh, desire of wanting to know everything. So, uh, no one uh, video release can cover every single base. But um, this is still finally a a supplement package that is worthy of being a a get carter release Uh, this film finally now has a true special edition uh, that is worthy of its iconic status so those are my thoughts on the bfi 4k restoration and physical media limited edition releases of the iconic 1971 masterpiece get carter one of not just the greatest british films ever made but one of the greatest films ever made Uh, this is finally 
the true special edition the film has always deserved. It is loaded with fantastic extras, uh, plus all of the original Warner extras and a brand new wonderful critical commentary. The restoration really has achieved some beautiful results. It is a a complete upgrade over the previous Warner Blu-ray, even if you're just still looking at the 1080p SDR disc. Uh, however, the 4K UHD with Dolby Vision grading does enhance dramatically over the already impressive 1080p BFI new Blu-ray. So this is another of those titles where if you have the ability to watch the UHD disc, I do h- highly in- encourage people to get the UHD version It is a dramatic improvement over the already impressive Blu-ray release. The HDR grading is very careful to not uh, damage the film's visual look or change anything. It is very subdued as all HDR grades for catalog titles should be. Uh, This is a release I never thought would happen. It's a release that is long overdue to finally give this film the respect it deserves. Uh, The the only things I would point out, again, uh, the, as, as potential drawbacks, I do wish that, while the extras are great, I do wish there was a little bit more or maybe a, a, an actual making of documentary piece. And it was kind of surprising to see some dirt and specks and artifacts pop up in the restoration transfer. Again, nothing is major and nothing ruins the transfer or anything, but it was just a little surprising in a beautiful new 4K presentation and everything to have some dirt and debris pop up every once in a while. But other than that, this is one of the best releases of 2022. This is a must-own release. This is a must-own release for any physical media collection or or any cinephiles library. It is finally giving Get Carter the respect it deserves. Uh, it, it is just a fantastic release overall. And finally giving Get Carter the proper royal treatment on home video that it has never gotten. The film has been uh, really kicked around on video. Again, this is, this is a dream release. This is a release I have hoped for and wished for for years. I, I was surprised we even got a Blu-ray back in 2014 and then that it was actually corrected by Warner Brothers in terms of the audio. But, you know, then more years went by and it just seemed like there would never be a, any sort of deluxe uh, release for Get Carter with actual, uh, you know, more extras than the old DVD had. So um, I, I am just so incredibly, incredibly thrilled that uh, we, we have received this and that it got the 4K treatment with Dolby Vision. Uh, it is a f- fantastic release. It is a must own release. And, uh, you know, finally, it's it's a video release that that doesn't make you feel like the the like the, the film is being treated like pesos in the snow. Uh, so. So um, I think the the only other thing that might have been able to improve this is perhaps if they had been able to include uh, Ted Lewis's original novel, which um, uh, he did write three books. The, he wrote the original book and then two prequels, uh, which uh, did finally get reprinted, and I would like to get those, but I think they've gone out of print again. So um, it would be nice if, if those were available as well. But um, this is one of the, the best releases of 2022, a fantastic release a must own title and um, you will have to import it though because it is a UK exclusive Uh, the Blu-rays are region B locked so you will have to have a region free player but other, the, of course, the 4K UHD is is without region encoding, so that's not a problem. Um, but uh, you know, for the special features and for the uh, Blu-ray disc, if you get that version, you will have to have uh, the ability to play region B disc uh, because this is a UK exclusive. Uh, there hasn't been any announcement uh, about US labels getting this 4K restoration. I would assume this would be a title Criterion would try and get and put out. So. They might get around to it in a year or two, or I don't know if somebody else will will try to license it from the BFI, but uh, or if it's a standard Warner release, who knows? Uh, but there hasn't been any news or movement on that front. So uh, as far as I can tell, uh, th- this is it for the time being. And it's also very affordable. It's not very expensive, and you can uh, import it from the BFI's website. 
or pick it up from a wonderful U.S. retailer like Orbit DVD, for example. So it's it's not very expensive whether you go with the Blu-ray or the UHD. It is a limited edition, so uh, please do purchase a copy uh, now rather than later because it will most definitely sell out. Uh, the extras included in the limited box are quite nice, and you will regret not having them when they just switch to the standard uh, disc only and standard case release because the included book is quite nice and so is the poster and hard box case. So I do encourage people to pick up the limited edition in either Blu-ray or 4K before it sells out. So uh, I, I hope this has been at least somewhat informative and fun to hear me once again babble on about classic films and masterpieces of the cinema like Get Carter. Uh, this is a dream release for me. This is a film I've been obsessed with ever since I saw it. It's one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, it is one of the truly great masterpiece films that deserves even greater acclaim and recognition, which now hopefully it garners with this new 4K restoration and release by the BFI. And as always, I truly encourage people to support both studio and boutique labels by buying films on disc releases like this to help keep both physical media and film culture alive. And as always, thank you ever so much for watching.